the wrong, so she'll correct me. Uh, she was, Debbie was much of my Old Testament lecturer. In the Brilliant of Regent's Park, Old Testament scholars H. Reader Robinson and G. Hinton Davis. Debbie, over to you. Thank you. Good. Well, um, thank you everybody for being here, for still being here on this beautiful day, having sat through two-thirds of this conference, and now you're to hear me. Um, let me just put myself some water. <coughs> yes, the Nephilim of the uh, of Regent's Park. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, we read of a time long ago, before the flood, <coughs> when there existed an unusual class of being, and I quote, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days. These were the heroes that were of old, warriors of renown. And this seemed to me to be a very appropriate <coughs> designation for two individuals in particular, both of whom were Baptist Old Testament scholars as well as principals of Regent's Park College. And the two in question are Henry Wheeler Robinson and Gwyn Henton Davis. And as the title of the paper indicates, I had hoped to consider each of them briefly in terms of their contributions to Old Testament scholarship. Time being of the essence, however, um, and uh, I have to confess my interest running away with me, um, I shall confine myself today to Wheeler Robinson, but this paper will probably have another iteration at the Society for Old Testament Studies conference in September when uh, Henton Davis will get his due. <coughs> Wheeler Robinson then, Henry Wheeler Robinson. Now I have to confess a certain amount of personal ambivalence towards the said gentleman from my initial introduction to him. Not that I ever knew him, you understand. Um, he died a long time before I was born. But uh, my first uh, encounter with him, as it were, was back in 1990 when as a young ministerial student, if you can picture that, I was privileged to interview the nonagenarian Violet Hedger, the first woman to undergo uh, college-based ministerial training and be ordained to the Baptist ministry, and of course she did so at Regent's Park College. Now, as, as you may well be aware, as a 19-year-old, Violet had been admitted to the London-based Regent's Park <coughs> College by the then principal, Dr George Gould, himself, I should add, a, an Old Testament scholar, though unpublished. But before Violet had actually begun her course, Gould retired and was succeeded by Wheeler Robinson, who didn't share Gould's pioneering attitude towards admitting women. Indeed, Violet told me that Wheeler Robinson didn't speak to her at all during her four-year course other than to tell her that she would fail. He even refused to authorise the college to pay her entrance fees for the London BD exams, a payment made as a matter of course for the male students, and so she had to pay said fees herself. Needless to say, she did pass, and I think with flying colours, and part of my uh, job on that visit was to hand her a cheque for £5 from the, uh, the newly... Um, how should I say, ascended principal then um, Paul Fiddis in repayment of the debt that the college owed her. Anyway, um, her attitude towards old Wheeler, as she referred to him, was <laughs> remarkably gracious as she, as she recounted this recollection to me, but I have to say it didn't really endear me to the fellow. So it was with some trepidation that I undertook to consider his scholarly persona. And I have actually found myself quite surprised, pleasantly surprised. Born in Northampton of humble origins, Robinson, along with his mother, was, as a very young child, taken in and supported by his mother's uncle and aunt, a couple called Hale and Dinah Morby, um, after Robinson's father <coughs> had uh, left the, the, the mother and child. The Wheeler in Robinson's name is actually his great-aunt's maiden name, which she gave to him. <coughs> now, the Morbys were stalwarts of Northampton's College Street Baptist Church, and Robinson was brought up in its sway, being baptised himself when he was 16. 
He was a serious and a scholarly child, and though he left school at 15 and worked for three years in the leather merchant's counting house, he continued to attend evening classes and to read widely. Um, I have to say much of this is taken from the memoir about him, which was written by Ernest Payne. It's very interesting. Um, his theological reading in particular, together with a sense of ministerial vocation, was encouraged by the church's assistant minister, who had recently arrived from Regent's Park College. And before long, with the support of his uncle and his mother, Robinson himself was heading to Regent's Park to begin his own preparation for ministry. He spent a year there at Regent's Park in London before transferring to Edinburgh for a four-year arts degree. Thereafter, he spent three years at Mansfield College here in Oxford for his vocational theological training, and then two years in Germany where he encountered the great scholars and teachers of the day. He ministered in Pitlochry in Scotland and then in Coventry before being called to teach at Rawdon Baptist College outside Leeds, uh, where he stayed for uh, from 1906 until 1920, so it was 14 years. Uh, and at that point, he was appointed here, well, uh, to Regent's Park College to succeed George Gould in 1920. The appointment was no sinecure. The college had not only to rebuild its institutional life following the devastation of World War I, but also to face the question of where it would be located in future since the lease on the premises in Regent's Park itself was coming to an end and would be too expensive for the college to renew. The details of the decision to move to Oxford and how it was accomplished over a number of years have been covered elsewhere, and I won't go into them, they're not our focus here, but they are certainly the background against which Wheeler Robinson's mature scholarship was produced. In fact, for 10 years between 1927 and 1937, while the move was being consolidated and funds for this building raised, the college was operating in both London and Oxford, and Robinson's time was divided between the two centres. Robinson was principal of Regent's Park College until 1942, retiring in the year of his 70th birthday, and he died from ill health just three years later, on the 12th of May, 1945. Why am I telling you that? Well, to give you some sense of the man and his background uh, against which to view his scholarship. Robinson's entire academic career was thus spent in the context of denominational ministerial training. And the strong Christian faith perspective that might be expected for such a scholar is evident in his work. Now, some of the titles of his Old Testament publications display such a perspective. For example, the three what I would call Old Testament cross volumes, the Cross of Job, which originated in lectures prepared for a lay audience while in the pastorate, the Cross of Jeremiah, and the Cross of the Servant, a study in Deutero-Isaiah, which uh, is, I understand, um, said to have influenced uh, Christopher North, another very well-known um, Old Testament scholar who uh, wrote very uh, seminal work on, on Deutero-Isaiah. Willa Robinson also produced several volumes of specifically Christian theology, including The Christian Doctrine of Man, in 1911, The Christian Experience of the Holy Spirit, in 1928, and Redemption and Revelation in the Actuality of History, in 1942. They were conceived of as a, a kind of trilogy of, of Christian theology. <coughs> Among his many articles are also those with a clearly Christian and devotional focus, as opposed to a more Old Testament one. But alongside his incontrovertible faith stance, Robinson was firmly convinced of the necessity to engage with the new critical scholarship that was emerging at that period from Germany. Julius Wellhausen's Epoch Making Geschichte Israels had been published in 1878, and the last decades of the 19th century were characterised by archaeological discoveries that put the early chapters of the Old Testament in a whole new light, and one might say a questionable light. 
Ernest Payne, in that biographical memoir of Robinson that I mentioned earlier, quotes from Robinson's own later reflections on that period, um, during which uh, he was a student. And uh, let me quote what Robinson himself wrote, looking back on those times, those uh, kind of 1890s. In the 90s, the student of theology was busy learning a new technique. The changeover to the critical outlook on the Bible was as great as that of the mechanization of armies. He had to prove all things and yet hold fast to that which was good. And we can see there a reference to what is, of course, the motto of Regent's Park College. Uh, fortunate was he, continued Robinson, if in those years he discovered that the authority of religious values is intrinsic, needing nobody's testimonial. So a lot was going on uh, in the scholarly atmosphere at the time when uh, Robinson was training and, and developing his, his uh, academic persona. But he seems to have come out of it with a, or with a firm conviction that critical scholarship was the way to go. Uh, and this commitment to critical scholarship is evident in his first scholarly publication outside of denominational pieces, and by that I mean um, articles in the Baptist Times and so on, uh, for which he, he wrote um, assiduously throughout his life. <laughs> um, this first piece of scholarship was a commentary on the books of Deuteronomy and Joshua in the Century Bible series. Um, his introduction to Deuteronomy tackles the potentially thorny issues of the book's origin and authorship. Um, uh, and I don't know how up you are with Old Testament scholarship on Deuteronomy, but let me say the origin and authorship of Deuteronomy is a thorny issue. <laughs> okay. Um, right. Um, but in, the, in his introduction, Robinson clearly espouses critical notions already established. Deuteronomy is a repository of 8th century prophetic teaching, 8th century BCE, that is, prophetic teaching, the core of which was written sometime in the 7th century BCE and became the impetus for King Josiah's uh, reform in 621 BCE. So, not Moses standing on the edge of the promised land declaiming. In its present form, Robinson uh, agrees, the book has been supplemented in at least three further stages, as can be deduced from its content and the existence of resumptive headings in the text. As to the question of authorship, acceptance of such an origin precludes Deuteronomy being the words of Moses as it claims to be. <coughs> But this apparent disingenuousness on the author's part is no hindrance to him or his work being considered inspired. Robinson points to the known and accepted ancient convention of writers putting their own words into the mouths of historical characters and to the conclusion that the writer of Deuteronomy was, quote, under the influence of those great 8th century prophets who did not hesitate to speak in the name of Yahweh, unquote, and he continues. The naive ascription of authorship uh, to Moses, honest then, would be dishonest now. But, and he puts this in italics, given the ancient standpoint... All that can be demanded of the author is that he should, if writing in the name of Moses, speak as Moses would have spoken were he still alive. The conscience of a 7th century writer intercepting the tradition of a great lawgiver has given us the book of law found in the temple. The writer has lent his own experience to Moses so that he, being dead, yet speaketh. There is no more reason to doubt the sincerity of the Deuteronomist than of Jeremiah. Each was convinced of the genuineness of his message, whether spoken as coming direct from God or mediated through a historic tradition. So Robinson takes the critical ideas uh, 
and runs with them, and yet is able to maintain um, a sense of the, of the divine origin uh, and the inspired uh, worth of the book, whether or not it's written by Moses. And I think uh, the, the bits that are in italics, given the ancient standpoint, um, points to something quite distinctive about Robinson's approach, and that is the need to understand the Old Testament literature in terms of its own time period and culture, rather than as something divorced from them. And this is what the, the critical perspective uh, provides. Um, and this, uh, this need that he felt uh, to approach the Old Testament in this way is reflected in his ongoing fascination with psychological aspects of, Robin, of Israel's religion and culture. And under this umbrella, I think, comes the signature concept uh, with which his name is virtually always associated, that of corporate personality, which I'm, you may well have heard of, even if you haven't heard of Wheeler Robinson. The idea itself can be seen already in Robinson's 1913 work, The Religious Ideas of the Old Testament, though he didn't provide a systematic treatment of it for another 25 years, until 1937, when he put it in an essay for a supplement to the German um, uh, journal um, ZAW, uh, an Old Testament journal. But the concept of corporate personality peppers Robinson's writings. It appears, for example, in his introduction to the theology of the Old Testament, which uh, came at the beginning of the teacher's commentary to which he contributed in 1932. In that introduction, he attributes uh, to this strong social sense, this <coughs> sense of corporate personality, quote, the peculiar emphasis of Hebrew ethics on the duties of social justice and mercy, an emphasis found not only in the great prophets, but also in the teaching of our Lord. And interestingly, of course, there he draws the link from what he sees in the Old Testament text to what he sees in the New Testament text. So all along, this faith perspective is driving what, he is, uh, what he's doing. Reference to corporate personality comes as well in his essay on Hebrew psychology for A.S. Peake's 1925 edited collection of essays from members of the Society for Old Testament Study. Um, <coughs> intriguingly, here... In this context, he claims corporate personality as the basis of the doctrine of original sin. The idea that the family or tribe or national unit is the primary unit of identity um, and responsibility rather than individual human beings, uh, corporate personality, meant that the entire human race of which Adam was a representative was tainted by the misdeeds of one member, and this shared responsibility, rather than a biologically inherited tendency to sinfulness, is what is at stake in the doctrine of original sin. So it's not that you, you, you can't help yourself sinning, but you are inevitably responsible for the sins of Adam, because Adam and you are part of a single, as it were, personality. A couple of pages later in that same essay uh, on uh, psychology in Peake's um, volume, he invokes corporate personality to account for the psychology of sacrifice in the identification of the offerer with the sacrifice uh, rather than understanding it as any transference of penalty. So quite a, a distinctive understanding of various um, aspects of um, Old Testament uh, literature that I think probably would not be followed today, it must be said. Corporate personality was also an element, not surprisingly, of Robinson's understanding of the I figure in the Psalms, you know, the, the, the personal Psalms, as he, as he demonstrated in a lecture given in Oxford on the social life of the Psalmists and later published. And perhaps most impressively, Robinson uses the concept of corporate personality as a key to interpret the perplexing pictures of the servant in Isaiah 40 to 55, 
especially in the passage of the suffering servant in Isaiah 53. <coughs> Basing himself then on contemporary anthropological ideas about primitive tribes, um, he argues that there is a fluidity of conception between the individual and the group unknown to modern thought, whereby it was possible, quote, to think at once of the individual in the collective and the collective in the individual without any difficulty, unquote. That's from the uh, cross in the Old Testament. Uh, they, the cross in Deutero Isaiah. And that, it's that understanding of interchangeability uh, which allows for the servant to be understood both of the nation of Israel, uh, certainly as Jewish tradition would have it, and also of Jesus as the Messiah. So these are not two, uh, it's not either or, it's both and. <coughs> Now, over the years, the, the concept, as I said, of corporate personality has been critiqued, and the anthropological understandings on which it's based have been discredited. Nevertheless, the conviction that the biblical text must be fully understood on its own terms, in particular in its own historical and cultural context, rather than according to our own presuppositions, I think is one that still remains. Um, and this is a, as I said, it's a distinctive feature of Robinson's outlook and encapsulated, I think, very well in a 1936 article of his from the Expository Times entitled The Best Books on the Old Testament. Here he begins his list of recommendations with W. Robertson Smith's published series of lectures on the Old Testament in the Jewish Church, which... Wheeler Robinson claims is one of the best books to convince a serious student of the necessity for the critical analysis of the Old Testament. And I think that insistence on the necessity of the critical analysis of the Old Testament is, again, is distinctive. So, um, and also to help the student see the general results of that analysis. Then in the article, uh, Robinson goes on to list works on geography, history and religion, as well as studies on topics of particular interest, Babylonian, Assyrian um, comparative materials, and on archaeology, a whole gamut of, of intellectual tools. Um, <clears throat> another very, um, I think, striking uh, aspect of this insistence on critical scholarship alongside the, the conviction uh, that this is vital uh, for a religious uh, purpose is um, in, a, in another article, in an earlier article, again from the Expository Times in 1930, where in talking about national contributions to biblical science, the contribution of Great Britain to Old Testament study, Robinson begins with a definition. Quote, the scientific study of the Old Testament means the examination of its elements by the full employment of all the general methods of literary and historical study. Linguistic, archaeological, geographical, anthropological, comparative, even theological and philosophical. Always provided that the literature shall be allowed to speak for itself without conscious correction by any of the vested interests of church or creed. Uh, and then um, the range of resources that he cites in the article that we were talking about before, uh, the best books for studying the Old Testament, corresponds well to that definition that he just gives. But it is striking um, that he insists that the literature should be allowed to speak for itself without the doctrinal impositions of a later age. Later on in that uh, same second article, he cites the cases of Samuel Davidson and Bishop Colenso, both of whom were deprived of their posts because of their unorthodox, i.e. critical, publications on Old Testament. The need for Frank and scientific criticism of the text is obviously very important to Wheeler Robinson. But alongside this insistence on the freedom for unfettered intellectual endeavour goes, as I said, this other conviction which is equally strong and that relates 
to the religious importance of both the text and the scholarship that engages with that text. Later on in the, the best books to study the Old Testament article, Robinson compares the British and German attitudes to Old Testament scholarship as he sees them. It is significant of our British attitude that we are never content with the pre-war, pre-First World War, I think this is, pre-war German divorce between university and pastoral teaching. We rightly feel that truth does not allow of this compartmental treatment. Even the protests of obscurantism and literalism reveal the true instinct that the conclusions of scholarship are vital to religion. This religious interest is the true explanation of much that would seem to be merely obscurantism or entrenched conservatism in the history of the science in Great Britain. If we have been slow to follow where others have led, it is partly because we realised better than they the magnitude of the issues involved. We shall never be satisfied to leave the Old Testament to the scholar pure and simple. Uh, and at this point he inserts a footnote saying, there seems to be nothing in German to correspond with our century and Cambridge Bibles, i.e. materials that are accessible to the lay public <coughs> but uh, reproduce the results of scholarship. He continues, we ask for more in a commentary than would appeal to the scholar, and we ask for less of what is of merely academic interest, such as the majority of the textual emendations of some commentaries of today. I'm sure you've all read commentaries like that. There are numerous signs that post-war Germany is growingly conscious of the truth of this religious emphasis. Recent German work is more human and less purely technical in its treatment of the Old Testament. As a contributor to the Century Bible series, in which he treats Deuteronomy and Joshua, as we said earlier, Robinson was well placed to make this observation. His own Century volumes certainly deal with the technicalities of the texts, such as possible additions to an original core, notes on names and places, the meaning of obscure phrases, and so on. But the introductions that he provides to both Joshua and Deuteronomy make it clear that he is convinced of their religious value, which shines through, regardless of the critical technicalities noted by scholarship. Consider, too, these thoughts of his on the question of canonicity and inspiration voiced in yet another Expository Times article from 1935. Having discussed the vexed question of the limits of the canon and how it might historically have been determined, fully recognising the uncertainties that abound regarding the exact historical process as well as the evident disagreements between faith communities on the limits of the canon, Robinson concludes, Revelation and therefore the canonicity of the scriptures which mediate it cannot be objectified and isolated in any external and material object. Revelation implies that unity of spirit uh, and oh, spirit and spirit, is that right? Which comes from the contact of life with life. Yes, it is right. The life of Israel, the old and the new, with the life of today. So a unity of spirit and spirit which comes from the contact of life with life. The life of Israel and the life of today. In that context, there are sacramental means, um, amongst which, for Protestants in particular, the Bible is foremost. The Bible mediates a faith and a life which continue today the dynamic quality of the religion of the Bible. In that unity of the testimonium spiritus sancti internum, the internal witness of the Holy Spirit, the fact of revelation is vindicated and with it the canonicity of the scriptures considered as a whole, and with full recognition of its debatable margins. These uncertainties were there, as we have seen from the beginning, and they remain there as a warning against mechanical conceptions of what canonicity and, with it, inspiration mean. Um, the Roman Catholic doctrine of the canon is definite to the last degree, 
The Protestant, on the other hand, must base his own recognition of that unique quality on the intrinsic worth and ministry of the books themselves, as witnessed by his own response to their message under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. But this doesn't make re revelation merely subjective, nor does it destroy the conception of canonicity. The authority of the scriptures needs no testimony from man because it rests on the testimony of the Holy Spirit himself, confirming his truth uh, without, by the creation of an echoing truth within. The principle is as valid as that of any interpretation of the rationality or beauty of the universe. So clearly Robinson held together um, the insights of historical criticism with the conviction that the Bible, however you defined it, was in some sense inspired <coughs> and authoritative. Now, um, I, I realise I must stop, which you may be glad about, but just um, a couple of comments to end up with that. Um, what he uh, tried to do, I suspect, may well not uh, wash <laughs> quite as well today. Um, what he's doing, I think, in that latter paragraph, obviously he's insisting on the um, religious <coughs> value of the scriptures and of, we, of what we know is canonical, but he's also admitting that there is no academic sense in which something can be proved to be canonical. So I suppose, strictly speaking, that part of his argument is outside of the academic realm. Um, so He's admitting that what is canonical is to some extent a matter of conviction, um, or of course a testimony of the church over the centuries has helped. Um, and I, yes, I think it's kind of hard to argue your way from historical criticism to a doctrine of inspiration. Um, <clears throat> also, I, it must be said that in other ways, uh, Wheeler Robinson, as one might expect, is decidedly unreformed, uh, particularly thinking of. Um, the book of Joshua, he doesn't seem to be phased at all by the idea of the violence in it, which of course today is a very uh, grave concern, um, the ideology of the biblical text, which is you know, recognised and, and, and questioned in a way that I think it would not have been. Uh, by Robinson. Um, he also has no, one, no sense of the one-sidedness of the sexual morality laws in Deuteronomy 22, for example, where he says, the maiden who is, what is it, the maiden who is violated must marry her, no violator. And you think, well, yeah, would I really want to do that? No, thank you. But he seemed to think it's a good thing anyway. Um, so, but I think, obviously, he was a man of his time. Um, and he... What more can we say, really? He also quotes approvingly the pictures in Proverbs um, of the woman as a housekeeper, freeing up the man to go and do the, the, the work in the outside, in the public sphere. Um, so, yes, quite, a, quite unreconstructed in those ways. But certainly it's this, what really struck me about him and what I hope has come through is the sense that... Um, over and above all of the critical scholarship, that is, that's not all there is to it. There is this um, strong religious, spiritual value to the texts and that um, the criticism that we undergo can actually help us to appreciate that. The, the criticism is not fighting against uh, the, the religious value and we need to take the two together. Uh, and they need to come forward together if we are really going to um, get the best out of the text, if I can put it in such a mundane fashion. Okay, there we are. Thank you. Thank you.